Maybe it's not a big deal to Putin. Maybe he doesn't value life the way that the U.S. military, Western countries do. Just look at the war that he's prosecuting in Ukraine. And maybe he's prepared to go two, three, four times that. It's the only thing I can think of, because otherwise, how how is the Russian military, uh, you know, not up in arms over what's happening now? These are lambs being led to slaughter, and they're also engaging in war crimes themselves. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Backstory. I'm Dana Lewis. Has Russian leader, some call him Pariah Putin, now reduced Russia's standing to a fringe power? A month after the war started, his army, which outnumbered the Ukrainians, is facing defeat in Ukraine. And by launching a failing, bloody war, killing thousands of innocent Ukrainians, leveling residential areas, sending thousands of Russian soldiers home in body bags, has he hastened Russia's demotion to a third-rate country, leaving a much weaker Russia for all to see? The Sufan's Colin Clark says no question. Former Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Kasyanov speaks outside of Russia about Putin's failures, a collapsing economy, a dark time for Russians, many of whom want Putin to go. But first, on the ground in Kiev, Paul Nyland, writer and resident, describes his last month living in the capital of a nation under siege, but more than ready to fight on. And your timing is perfect because the air raid siren just went off. Maybe that's not such good timing. Maybe you should be in a basement. Nah, you know, I mean, it sounds flippant, but uh, but I'm used to it. I mean, when when I was in Kiev still, it was seven times a day. Here it was four times yesterday. This is already at least the second time today. Um, I, there, I mean, there is a, a basement here, but... But so far, I mean, there's been strikes on the on the outskirts of Kiev at the uh, at the airport, but um, nothing in the it, sorry of Lviv, nothing in the center of Lviv. So I'm I'm feeling relatively relatively comfortable. Tell me, so, tell me, what has your life been like the last couple of weeks? I mean, uh, last time I talked to you on the telephone, you were going to the street with to, you know to with a weapon to defend Kiev. I mean, did you actually do that? And what is your life like day in day out there? So uh, I, I joined the local um, security detail that is looking after the residential uh, area where I live. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in Kiev in the city itself. And so far, the, the Russian invasion forces have not breached the city. So um, I, I, I haven't been involved in any fighting. And my, my hope is that I don't have to be. But, you know, friends of mine are. And and that's that's my biggest concern. You know, I, I have I have plenty of friends who are literally there with automatic weapons, and they're they're there on the front line, and they're 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 defending this city and making sure that that uh, the city or that city, I'm in Lviv at the moment, but um, they're defending Kiev and making sure the city's not breached. Um, it, it's war. It's brutal. I mean, it's brutal, Paul. Uh, and and I don't have to tell him. You, you know it better than I do because you're there. But this stalling of Russian forces mm -hmm. isn't necessarily a good thing because they're sitting on the edges of, of cities like Mariupol and Kharkiv and Kiev to a, a smaller degree, just pounding the hell out of them with no regard to civilians and destroying, slowly destroying these cities. Uh, with regard to Mariupol, they're not on the outskirts of the city. They're in the city, and they're not slowly destroying it. They are destroying it at, a, at an incredible pace, actually. What's happening in Mariupol particularly is brutal, and um, we, we have to examine the reasons why. There are, there are three key cities that are uh, the major population centers that stand between Putin and the land bridge between the occupied Donbass and the illegally annexed Crimea. And those cities are Mariupol, uh, Berdyansk, and Melitopol. Um, Melitopol and Berjansk have uh, also been occupied as well, um, but we see the civilian resistance that's going on in each of those cities. Um, they are not yet being uh, pulverized in the same way as Mariupol is, but 
in, in Mariupol, I, I read the reports that between 80 and 90 percent of the buildings in the city, and this was a city of 510,000 people, Dana. I mean, this is not a small place. It's not a village, right? There's 510,000 people normally resident there. Um, and, it, and it is being absolutely demolished uh, by Russian forces, by Russian airstrikes and by uh, Russian artillery. Um, and uh, now the Russian forces are in the city and they're going street to street and uh, simply summarily executing people who, who get in their way and, and resist their occupation. How does this end? I mean, do you have a sense that, I mean, Zelensky keeps inviting Putin to a negotiating table, but what is victory for Putin right now in Ukraine? I, I think that I think that what Putin is doing with, uh, for example, the, the attacks on Kiev, I think that's more symbolic. And, uh, you know, with Kiev being such a large city, there is actually no way that Russia could ever encircle it. They can attempt to make or to, 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 to make inroads into the city, to infiltrate the city through various different directions, which they have done over the last couple of weeks. But, but Kiev will never fall. Kiev will never be taken by the Russians. And, and I mean, if you extrapolate the idea that they would take it, then they could never hold it. I mean, the, I, I was watching yesterday a piece on uh, CNN and uh, David Petraeus was was saying, you know, the the you you can look at the numbers of the forces and say the Russians have got two hundred thousand, the Ukrainians got a hundred thousand, but it's not quite that simple. The Ukrainians have got a hundred thousand plus every able-bodied male in the country, right? So everybody, and you, you asked earlier on about my personal involvement, everybody who um, is able to, in one way or another, resist, um, and whether that be people taking up arms. Or so whether that's the the babushki, the the grandmothers in places like Kherson who are standing in front of uh, Russian tanks and armored personnel carriers, and you know they're they're unarmed and they're peacefully protesting, and they're literally turning Russian military vehicles uh, around. And so, yeah, the, the the resistance to any Russian occupation is 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 going to be never ending. So never, the question is the question is the, never mess with a babushki. Never mess with the babushki. That is the golden rule. The, the question is, what does victory look like for Putin? I, I think that that everything else that he's doing is a masquerade for him to uh, cement control over that land bridge to Crimea. Um, and what I've said consistently is that uh, he cannot be allowed to keep those cities and that land as the spoils of this war. It, it's not just about that territory. It's also about Ukraine's access to the Sea of Azov, um, and the, why, why didn't he just Paul? Why didn't he just concentrate his forces then in the south, take the land bridge, move in from the Donbass, and and settle for that? Why, why did he have to, you know, attack all, all of Ukraine to to a, a degree? You know, and I understand most of the West has so far been spared. But. Well, um, if you want the short answer to that, the the short answer is that he's insane. It, it really is that simple. Vladimir Putin is insane. If you want a longer answer, you can see it in the the long five thousand word essay that he wrote about the the existential brotherhood between Ukraine and Russia, which was, I think, in July or August of last year. He published this, and you know, um, his his understanding of Ukraine um, is is partially uh, a misreading of the situation here, and in part, it's due to the fact that the people who report to him have reported to him what they thought he wanted to hear, right? So Putin has been told, we'll be welcome. You, you go back to this idea then, if if I can jump ahead of you, then th that he thought it was going to be easy, that that he would get yeah. would be welcomed, and those troops to some degree would have a, an easy ride into Kiev and regime change. The, there's actually quite a funny story involved there as well. There were a number of uh, senior FSB figures who were put under house arrest last week um, and the, the story behind that is that they'd been given a, a, a war chest, a treasure chest of money uh, with which to uh, coerce people in Ukraine into standing with the, 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 the Russian movement when it eventually came. And it was something to the tune of five billion dollars. But as is the Russian way, instead of them actually spending that money as was intended, it was all stolen and spent on apartments in Dubai and, you know, the, the usual kind of Russian corruption. Well, they, right? they have a good example to follow. I mean, the president himself, you know, has uh, squirreled away more money than any leader in the world. 
he's believed to be, if you listen to Bill Browder, um, the architect of the Magnitsky laws, uh, Putin is believed to be the richest man on the face of the planet, wealthier even than Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I understand that the Ukrainian armies fought well. I understand in some cases they've counterattacked. Do you get a sense there that they are able just not to hold Kiev, but that they're they're able to reverse the Russian, you know, if you want to use the analogy of a boa constrictor, slowly trying to squeeze their way around Ukraine. Are they counterattacking and are they pushing back, you know, multiple uh, launch rocket systems and artillery that if they are not pushed back and dig in, will simply start to destroy Kiev from, by shelling from a distance? So there's, there's two answers to that. Number one is that the Ukrainian armed forces already are pushing back. Um, one of the Russian attempts to get closer to uh, the city of Kiev itself was the outerlying cities of uh, Bucha and Irpin and Hostomel, where there's uh, an airfield, which was day one of the war. The Russians landed paratroopers in there in attack helicopters, and, and they tried to take that airstrip so that they could bring in more supplies and, and, and have more of a, a chance of attacking uh, Kiev. Um, so the, the Ukrainian military has already uh, pushed people or pushed the Russian invaders back out of those um, outlying regions of, of Kiev. Um, I read yesterday as well that um, there's a city on the Zhutomir Highway, which leads uh, from the west of Ukraine into Kiev. That's also now being liberated as well. So hopefully when I return to Kiev, I'll be able to do it on the main road rather than having to take the kind of detour that I took when I when I came out. But with, with regard to uh, pushing back against the multiple rocket launch systems and the artillery, um, this is one of the reasons why, in actual fact, Ukraine needs the uh, air support um, that we've been asking for for two weeks. Yes, it's needed to defend places like Kharkiv uh, from the same kind of artillery attacks, um, and it's needed to defend uh, Mariupol from the brutality that's going on there, but also to, to simply strafe those land forces um, and the 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 the, uh, the batteries of uh, MRLS systems that are lying on the outskirts of each of those cities. Uh, we we need air power. We we need to get planes up in the air to to take the well to to destroy those positions and to destroy the threat that they face to the civilian sensors. But you're not going to get them. I mean, you're not going to get it. They're, they're not going to be NATO airplanes. Whether no. they finally push forward with this, you know, Poland's plan to hand over 28 MIGs. I mean, maybe that's the Maybe that's a compromise and why they need to do that, whether they do that in a clandestine way or they, they announce it and do it. I mean, I guess that's up for debate as well. I, it's not just Poland. It's also the Baltic states. And there's a couple of other countries that are signifying <clears throat> their um, willingness to uh, provide uh, aircraft to uh, to Ukraine. Um, the, the idea of uh, whether it is a NATO airplane or or, or otherwise is a debate that many people have got bogged down in. And, you know, Jens Stoltenberg was very clear, like two weeks ago, he did a press conference and he said, there will be no NATO troops on the ground. There will be no NATO forces involved in this. Biden country. said the same thing. And, and you know, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. It's not entitled to Article 5 uh, uh, protection. We understand all of that. However, at the same time, and, you know, former uh, ambassadors such as uh, Chris Alexander of Canada and uh, Francis O'Donnell of the United Nations, um, they've argued that uh, there are United Nations provisions, specifically Article 51, which is the, the, the responsibility to protect. And any sovereign nation, regardless of whether they might or might not be a member of NATO, I mean, it could be a neutral country such as Sweden, um, who uh, in actual fact, Sweden in 1939 sent aircraft to the there's, assistance. There's, there's that whole nuclear war thing. Uh, you know, uh, and again, Vladimir Putin has been excellent at manipulating the debate around to this subject of the threat of nuclear war. Um, one thing that very few people realize is it, it's not like in the United States, where there's the football and ultimately it's the commander in chief that has the sole authority to press that button. Putin doesn't actually have that. Putin would need the sign off from his upper military uh, echelons to be able to launch a nuclear strike. And they don't have the appetite for it. They, they, they're they already turning on him. And we know this because in actual fact, the, the intel that the West had about what Putin was actually planning was so detailed 
that it can only have come from that inner circle of the generals themselves. And that's why when you see these images of Putin sitting at this stupidly long table and he's keeping the generals literally at you know, a half a football field of length away from him. That's because he doesn't trust them with good reason. They're not going to back him. And even more so now that their troops have been, you know, uh, uh, wiped out it, here in here in Ukraine. I mean, they admitted yeah. yesterday of 9,600 losses. Yeah. That, that I, is- I, I was just going to mention, I mean, those numbers that were leaked to uh, Komsomolskaya Pravda, are st- startling numbers of, of you know, more than 9,600 troops yep. that have been killed in action, Russian troops, and more, and I think another uh, 15,000 that are wounded. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, the Americans don't have those numbers after 20 years. Collectively, if you combine Afghanistan and Iraq together, I mean, they are, they are jaw-dropping, jaw-dropping numbers. Paul, j- just to let you go, um, can this go on for months more? I mean, as, as they take over Mariupol as they slowly push and try to fight around Odessa and they try to hit Kiev. I mean, can this drag out for months and months and, and millions more being displaced? Um, or do you see it, do you see it ending more quickly than that somehow? So in part, uh, the, the answer to your question is in the last point that you just made about the, the troop losses. Um, how long can Russia sustain that level of uh, of death uh, amongst their armed forces without there being a revolution in Russia against Vladimir Putin and against what he's doing, whether that's a palace coup or whether that's a, a popular uprising on the streets. You know, as the Russian people learn what is happening to their troops because of Putin's massive miscalculation here, they're, they're going to object. Um, that's one answer. You know, the other answer, you also just mentioned Odessa as well. Odessa, famously a Russian-speaking city, wants absolutely nothing to do with this. Odessa, of a, you know, a city of a million people, is never going to be held by Vladimir Putin. So, what is the point of them attacking down there? You know, if if Vladimir Putin's continued end game is not just the land bridge from occupied Donbass to uh, to to the Crimean Peninsula, but also then from Crimea to the west of there to link up with Transnistria, um, the Russian uh, occupied enclave Moldova. of Moldova. Yeah. You know, then then that puts Odessa into play. But he can't he can't hold Odessa. To to guess at how this war ends or when this war ends, I, I think is a is a bit of a fool's game. Um what what we can do is we can look at how we can speed an end to this war and how we speed an end to this war is it's providing more and more military support to the Ukrainian armed forces so that um, and we don't actually need boots on the ground from anyone else we will do the job ourselves just give us the tools and we will finish this yeah. and finish it Dana not only for Ukraine and for Ukraine's war but finish it also for the people of Belarus because Lukashenko is obviously supporting Putin and finish it for the people of Russia who by and large should be sick and tired of this dictator that has been looting from them for two decades now so let's hope that you know, Ukraine's victory is a victory for the wider region, and it also averts the threat to the Baltic states, to Poland, Russia's now threatening Bosnia, Croatia, and, and various other countries too. Ukraine's victory is a victory for all of us. Paul Nyland, Paul, you know, take care of yourself, and, it, and thank you for talking. Yeah. Thank you, Dana. Colin Clark is the director of research at the Sufan Group, which is a global intelligence and security consultancy. Good to talk to you again, Colin. Thanks for having me. I'm, I am shocked at this leak that was in Komsomolskaya Pravda yesterday. And I have to ask you about it. Um, and I know you're not going to be able to comment on the numbers, but it gives us some indication of where the Russians are in Ukraine. That's a pro-Kremlin tabloid. It said, according to the Russian Ministry of Defense, 9,861 Russian soldiers died in Ukraine. 16,000 more were injured. Um, the, the last official KIA number from the Russian Foreign Ministry was about 498, which is 20 days ago. That is more than the U.S. lost in Afghanistan and Iraq combined in 20 years. It's a startling number if it's true. 
It is. And I thought the same thing all day yesterday after having read it. And then sitting here reflecting, reading again this morning, uh, I, I started, you know, thinking about what we often talk about in engagements like this, which is too often the U.S. mirror images. Maybe it's not a big deal to Putin. Maybe he doesn't value life the way that the U.S. military, Western countries do. Just look at the war that he's prosecuting in Ukraine. And maybe he's prepared to go two, three, four times that. It's the only thing I can think of, because otherwise, how how is the Russian military, uh, you know, not up in arms over what's happening now. These are lambs being led to slaughter, and they're also engaging in war crimes themselves. Uh, I don't think any soldier in their right mind would think that what's happening here is normal. Even if he doesn't value life, and I cover the war in Chechnya, and I don't think he does, uh, whether it be Russian nationals who were caught in Grozny under fuel air bombs, all in the name of Putin's fight against terrorism. Everybody was terrorists. Now in Ukraine, everybody's Nazis, and it's about denazification. Or but, look at Aleppo and the way that the Russian Air Force bombs Syrian civilians there. So I, you know, I have no doubt uh, that you, you know Putin is uh, really a war criminal. There's no other way to put it. That's an accurate term. But it does speak to the ability of the Russian military. And that if you add up those numbers, that's about a tenth. That's a, a division and a half of an American uh, military unit. That's about a tenth of the existing Russian army on paper, if it, if it even exists. So it really speaks to whether they're able to go forward and about how badly they've prosecuted this war so far. You know, it makes me think about what we often talk about in this business and, and among, you know, uh, with the in, the intelligence community and, and analysts like myself that are following these issues, which is the need to <clears throat> constantly reassess our assumptions. And I can't tell you how many war games I've been in over the years where we war game a scenario and the first move is Russia totally crushing Western forces with a massive cyber attack and we can't operate and the Russians are doing all these different maneuvers. That's not the case. We've made our enemy out to be 10 feet tall. Uh, the Ukrainians, let's give them credit. I mean, they're fighting heroically, but this Russian military, like you said, uh, you know, looks like one thing on paper. We don't fight wars on paper. The Russian military looks third rate at best. And, you know, in, in my defense one piece, I make the argument that, that I don't even think we should refer to Russia in the same conversation when we talk about great power competition anymore. They, they have their, their gas station with nukes. They're far from a great power. You wrote in that article, um, and I thought it was a great piece, Russia's Potemkin military during its unprovoked invasion of, of, of Ukraine has revealed that Moscow is little more than a second-rate power. The demotion of one great power is more than semantics. It presages an accelerated competition between the remaining two. Are you writing Russia off a bit too early here? I don't think so. I mean, I think you know the, the need for me to write this piece was what I'm viewing as this tectonic shift. And uh, yeah, I, I guess maybe in some ways, right, we're four weeks into this. Uh, but at the same time, the the uh, the response from the West, the totally crushing sanctions, the uniformity with which the private sector has moved against Russia, uh, this is going to be an economic death knell like one we haven't seen in modern history. And it's going to force the Russians to you know, use every lifeline they have. Now, that's a pretty big lifeline from China. But I think that this just moves Russia into junior partner status. Uh, and, and we're really kind of setting the table now for what I think is a return to true bipolarity and a system that we've talked about for a while now. The president's talked about it, democracies versus autocracies. Is, is this why Sergei Lavrov, the, the foreign minister, speaks about, and I hesitate to quote him, because you know, this is the guy who said there wasn't going to be an invasion. Then it, it was only going to be in the Donbass. Then he's denied that cities are being attacked. Then he's denied that you know, residential areas are being attacked, and it goes on and on. I mean, Lavrov is a, is a Kremlin puppet, and he pretty doesn't have much credibility. But he, he says that the fight in Ukraine is about the world order, quote unquote. This is not about Ukraine at all, not all about Ukraine, then he corrected himself, but the world order, the current crisis, quote, is, is fateful, um, epical making moment in modern history. It reflects the battle over which the world order will look like 
Uh, this could have been solved peacefully and Russia was trying for years. Let's not, let's not get into that because a lot of people think that he's just blowing smoke there and the Russians were fanning the flames all along. But what, I mean, he is really making this out to be a struggle um, for a new world, not a new world order, but the world order. What's he talking about? What's well, a masterclass in gaslighting to begin with? Uh, but leaving that aside, uh, I, maybe he's right. He's just not right in the way that he thinks he is. Uh, th- what we're seeing now is is very much, uh, you know, setting up for the potential to reshuffle what the international order looks like. It's not going to end the way that Lavrov thinks it's, thinks it's going to end with Russia expanding its sphere of influence. This is really, again, relegating Russia to the back bench uh, because it's clear that Russia can't even defeat Ukraine. Uh, again, that's not to take anything away from the Ukrainians. And also, you know, NATO countries have been uh, aggressively arming the Ukrainians with javelins, with stingers, with other sorts of, uh, you know, pretty sophisticated weaponry. Uh, and so I think, you know, they're fighting asymmetrically. Look, the Russians are learning the hard way what the United States learned in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and, and, you know, even on paper, a military much smaller than yours can be difficult to defeat. And then you have to deal with the second and third order consequences. Russia's not prepared for it. Its military looks unprepared and unmotivated. The, the soldiers weren't even told what they were going to do when they went into fight. Uh, and there's clear command and control and massive logistical issues. So uh, this is not the military that most in the West thought uh, would be rolling onto the battlefield. I mean, President Putin is a student of history at the very least. He likes to quote it and torque it up pretty good sometimes. I mean, the way he the way he regurgitates history is not exactly how most of us would would see history. But you know, never mind America's experience in Afghanistan. Look at Russia's experience in the Soviets' experience in Afghanistan, um, and a lot of people say that preceded the fall of the Soviet Union and led to, you know, partially led to the collapse. So you wrote by attempting to to recreate the glory of the former Soviet Union, Putin has precipitated Russia's downfall, amplifying the Kremlin's weaknesses. Um, do you think this is the end of Putin's regime? And that Russia itself will not easily get up off its knees from from launching this conflict. Yeah, I don't know if it's the end of Putin. We've seen certainly there's been many times where I thought, well, Assad can't go on anymore. Right. Someone's going to get rid of him. And, and here we are. We're, we're, we're seeing the normalization of Assad with the recent visit of uh, UAE leaders. So, you know, I, I don't count these dictators out. Uh, you know, what we witnessed in North Korea over the years, right? Uh, Many people don't think that it's sustainable, but these autocracies have power. Uh, They use propaganda to their advantage and they're willing to be ruthless and draconian. And we've seen that every day in unfolding on on our televisions. I do think this is a catalyzing event uh, that's again, likely to kind of um, shift Russia from, you know, when we talk about near peers. Russia is just not a near peer. It's not on the same level as the United States or China. Uh, It clearly falls into China's camp. And I think it's going to do so, but it's going to do so in a subservient role. Um, But, you know, Xi Jinping will allow Putin to uh, keep his dignity. Uh, I I just don't see any way that Russia is on par on the same level now, particularly after the, the regime is a pariah regime where it's more sanctioned than North Korea, and its leaders just, you know, shouldn't be able to show their face uh, in international fora, frankly. What would you say about the recruitment of foreign fighters? Because you've talked about Syria by Russia now. Yeah, you know, I'll believe that when I actually see it. Uh, if Syrian mercenaries make their way onto the battlefield, we've seen propaganda out of the Central African Republic. Look, if it's true, the Russian military is even more pathetic than we thought. If they're turning to a bunch of ragtag Syrian mercenaries, I think it's largely propaganda to show you know, it's the retort to Zelensky's call for this foreign legion, which has been answered. I mean, a lot of people have showed up from all around the world to fight on behalf of Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, independence. And so uh, you'll even notice in the number given when Zelensky said 16,000, the Russian side said 16,000 were coming. I think it's, you know, pure propaganda. Um, but again, if it's not, they're in even more trouble than we thought uh, with the need to call on cannon fodder, essentially, to send to the front line. Do you see how this ends somehow? I mean, Putin won a total victory over 
Ukraine, he certainly has some partial victory in the sense that he is pulverizing cities and, and Mariupol, no doubt, will, is, is going to fall, I think, to him for a limited time. Um, what has he settled for? A land bridge to Crimea and, and uh, annexation of the Donbass? Or how does he get himself out of this? Possibly. I mean, that that's a I think that's a feasible uh, end game there. I think, you know, there's a lot in the West talking about off ramps. There's a lot in the West saying that we shouldn't offer off ramps, that we should continue to attrit the Russian forces. Uh, but look, we are talking about a nuclear armed adversary. Uh, so we have to keep things in perspective. Um, I think it's going to come down to some kind of form, some some form of neutrality. Uh, you know, the Ukrainians don't want to give up territory. And I don't blame them in the way they've fought. They feel like they don't have to. And I feel the same way. But the reality is you're talking about a much stronger neighbor. Uh, and, and that may be the only way to end this. And far be it from me to tell someone else what to do with their own territory and country. I'm not in the, the business of giving that advice. I'm just trying to think through logical end games of your right, how this might play out, uh, what the Russians might accept and what the Ukrainian side might accept. That's that's what this is, is all about now, right? For for mediators and negotiators to find, you know, some kind of agreement that stops the bloodshed. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're seeing every single day. We're seeing, you know, millions of Ukrainians forced to flee their home. Terrible images of, of what the Russians are doing. It's barbaric, frankly. Uh, and I think, you know, that should be a lot of what the conversation is about, what Putin is doing in terms of killing civilians, women and children and committing war crimes on a regular basis. We shouldn't accept this as normal. Colin Clark of the Sufan Group. Colin, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, Mikhail Kasyanov joins us now. He is the former prime minister of Russia and he has run an opposition party. He has run for president in Russia. Um, Mikhail, welcome. Hello. Hello. I mean, what, what dark times? Uh, what dark times? Yes, absolutely, absolutely awful. It's terrible things going on. It's full-scale war. It is, uh, of course, a criminal activity of Putin's regime. Nobody expected such a development, but unfortunately, there's already one month last. Cities and villages of Ukraine are being devastated. Uh, people, civilians, are killed every day, and there's this awful thing going on. How does his inner circle uh, hold on and support him when the Russian economy has been shut down? Uh, they are a, a pariah um, state in many ways now. Um, the, 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 there are many uh, in Europe and around the world that are referring to them as war criminals, how long will they continue to support President Putin? Uh, I think that for them, it's absolutely no way out. And they are locked there, just, I mean, talking about inner circle. And they cannot change his uh, view on that because just uh, that the inner circle is those people as a group of assistants, but not of counselors and or partners, whatever. That's it, not, uh, it's not uh, the, something could be discussed uh, and different exchange of different views. They simply implementing Putin's orders. That's why uh, that is uh, uh, quite a mistake when uh, some people in the West saying just let this inner circle which under pressure would come and would would uh, uh, reinsure Putin just doing something different or those oligarchs. They are simply just slaves and just simply just uh, let's say people who assist um, uh, Putin to, to implement his policies uh, internal and externally. That's why just there is no uh, any expectation there's some kind of changes or internal coup, whatever, say, what you can use, uh, that could, 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 could take place. Talking about a wider circle of people, uh, of course, that is a completely different situation. And people right now started to understand middle class people who uh, get information from the internet. Though of course, they can compare. Many of them already are thousands, um, uh, hundreds of thousands already uh, left Russia because they don't want to live in such a situation where it's prohibited to call war, prohibited to call war. You have to imitate something, just people don't want to, to, to compromise with their, with their uh, destiny, with their 
you know, they're afraid. And that's why I just it is absolutely, absolutely uh, awful situation for them too. Of course, it's not comparable with those people who are in Ukraine, who are under bombing every day. But for Russians, uh, in three months time, Russians would start understanding that the situation is completely different. And they will continue, of course, as a result of propaganda. They are foolish, majority of people, foolish by propaganda. And they will continue to believe that um, the West, the US, and the other Western allies are responsible for that. But sooner or later, uh, in, in, in a few months, they start uh, even uh, more often asking the question uh, and the answers which Mr. Putin will provide them will provide them will not uh, will not uh, uh, explain the real situation they would not understand why they have a, such a tough uh, situation such condition sanctions are very tough not devastating yeah. yet because just still oil and gas in, in the export and and the foreign currency inflow in, into Russia continue to take place but uh, the, it, uh, the sanctions already destroying the financial system system and uh, very heavily influence on the economy. I think Russia would lose, I think this year, 10% uh, of its GDP. That will be a squeeze of the, of the whole economy. We will fall down just 20 years ago, and that will that will be awful for, for everyone. Is there a divide, do you think, inside Russia between the the people who grew up grew up in, in uh, communist times? Um, who remember the stories of the war, the World War II? Uh, who will who will bite on this bait from the Kremlin that we have to sacrifice for the state? Um, you know, hard times are in Russia's long-term interests. And then on the other side of that, younger people who have traveled, who have been in Europe, who uh, are exposed to to Western media who will look at a lot of this and say they don't want to be any part of this. They're not going to sacrifice for the state the way that the Kremlin is asking them to. Yeah, I think the division a little bit different, not necessarily just for those people who lived in the Soviet Union and who are not. Uh, there is a division in society. That's correct, absolutely. And uh, no, no, nobody knows just where this line uh, is. I think it's uh, approximately... 30-40% uh, support Putin and 50-60% um, uh, 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 just against the war. In fact, people living in, in the big cities, middle class, absolutely, they, uh, absolutely against war. But uh, we should recognize that Putin still have uh, his support, as it was on those imitation of elections. He got no, never got 60, uh, 85 or even 65 percent, but it was always 40, 45. Uh, once he he had 52 into in the year 2000. That was one time a real elections for, for him. But uh, still, uh, people uh, uh, there are uh, people who support Putin, but I'm sure that majority against the war, against the war, and that's why that's why just they don't know what to do. They're not ready to go to the streets and 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 you know, protest because. Because last year Putin demonstrated, and he created uh, scariness just among um, uh, in, in all the families. Uh, many people were put in jail. Just many people were beaten in the streets, and uh, they lost their jobs, they lost their university seats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. People are afraid right now to go to the streets to protest. But of course, silent protests, silent negativism is growing. And uh, as I said, as a result of sanctions, uh, the the the, the people's uh, view will change. But that is sanctions, that's punishment. That's not prevention of war. The problem is how to stop Putin and his, as he called, operation, how to stop this war. That's a different question, much more difficult rather than just to impose sanctions. That's what I think just uh, Western leaders should decide soon, because just it's impossible to watch how civilians are being killed by those air bombing or, or missiles, et cetera, et cetera, just. Uh, uh, civilian infrastructure being destroyed. It's, uh, uh, and civilian civilians are killed in their houses, and they they sitting in the basement of their of their of their houses or block of flats, and just every night waiting just when the uh, new bomb will, will fall down. <clears throat> it's just it's it's hard to watch. It's a, the largest humanitarian disaster since World War II. Uh, it gets worse, and you, you just look at places like Mariupol under constant bombardment. I mean, how does the West try to stop this rather than 
r- rather than just you know stopping it in Ukraine, but stopping it on the ground in Ukraine and uh, stop this carnage? I mean, what would you say has to be done? I think just the first goal should be to, uh, of stopping Putin, uh, Putin's military machine to bomb civilians and to kill civilians. It means non-fly zone, no fly zone. Of course, it's difficult for, for leaders to accept this, to impose this, but I think this is one of the NATO goals, in fact, to prevent, uh, to prevent civilians, to prevent civilians. I think that is the mission. It should be undertaken now. Just European Europeans are being killed right now in Ukraine. If they they wouldn't stop Putin now, just other Europeans would be killed in the, in the, in the future. That's why that is the front line right now, and I think that is crucial. And I remember in, in uh, when we uh, saw another disaster in in Syria when it was Aleppo was completely devastated by by Putin's bombardment. And at that time, you remember, just half of half of territory of Syria was under uh, no-fly zone, and uh, few NATO, NATO countries were there: the United States, France, and Turkey. They were there, and just uh, there was no uh, the, the, the Third World War didn't start. Just you should erase. You shouldn't. I mean, the West shouldn't follow just the Putin's uh, agenda and just to react on that. You should, the West should uh, uh, raise the stakes and uh, to impose non-flight zone. Let's Putin be afraid, be scared about that, but not vice versa. You use the term, the the front line for the rest of Europe. Um, do, some of the talk on Russian television, um, you know, talked about a land bridge to Kaliningrad. Uh, some of the commentators saying, let's go get... Uh, the Baltics, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Do you take that seriously? Uh, if if uh, Putin uh, uh, not, not stopped uh, here in Ukraine, I don't exclude just he next step will be to taste to test uh, Article Five of NATO Charter. Yeah, it means just um, invading and trying to invade and what another NATO country. Just the the Estonia, um, uh, the city Narva, it's 150 kilometers from 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 uh, Saint Petersburg. That's very easy. Putin just creating uh, uh, illusions that Ukraine uh, is uh, creating a danger for Russia. It's absolutely uh, it's nonsense. NATO already in, and we live exist just very friendly. Estonia, Latvia, uh, Lithuania nearby. Uh, as I said, just uh, Estonia just that is very close to Saint Petersburg, just uh, uh, the town from which uh, Putin appeared. Yeah. That's a, that is that not not the reasons, but I think I think talking about talking about uh, uh, ex, uh, export, uh, I would say. Uh, further invasion or further um, explosion of such such aggressive aggressive mentality aggressive policy just um, the direct direct confrontation with the one or another small NATO country could be can you just talk to me about russians who were able to speak out uh, and criticize the regime like yourself i mean you ran the and run the parnas uh, independent political party, um, but many parties have been silenced now. Uh, Navalny's anti-corruption foundation was closed down, some 40 offices. Um, I assume you've come under a lot of pressure yourself. There is simply no room uh, for any opposition to Putin, uh, especially in the last few weeks. Would you agree with that? And And are you able to carry on any kind of political activities now at all? Uh, I, I should emphasize last year, just um, the last year, the opposition was completely destroyed. And uh, you mentioned that Navalny was put in jail, just uh, some other parties were uh, uh, closed. Uh, I wouldn't say closed, but prevented for elections. My party was prohibited to participate in elections last year. Uh, and in fact, just pressure on all uh, political activists just uh, was growing and now very high. But uh, we still wanted and had an opportunity to criticize and exchange our views and to deliver through internet these views, our uh, judgment to, to, to people. But now, recently, after the beginning of this war, uh, Putin's regime, they adopted a number of legislation which right now just uh, uh, saying that all this criticism of this uh, military operation or of even calling the military operation the war and uh, all criticism could be absolutely uh, crit- uh, uh, 
used or could be could be considered as as a criminal activity. And, Fifteen years uh, in prison. Yeah, and people could be put just for five or up to 15 years in prison for yeah. that. That's what after that, after that, uh, when this was adopted, many people just had to leave Russia. I myself also just outside Russia right now because of because of this new legislation, because it's, it was the risk I, I survived and I lived for all those 15 previous years. You remember that my friend and my political uh, collaborator partner, Boris Nimsov, was killed near Kremlin. Uh, uh, Navalny was put in jail. Uh, yesterday, he was convicted for another nine years in, uh, in, in, in jail. Just this is a, a very hard pressure. And just this risk, which right now we already have, that's already uh, not, not uh, it's, it is serious risk. That's why people, people live in Russia. Notable that, that Boris Nemtsov was killed in 2015, one year after the Russian invasion of Crimea. Um, and, you know, outside observers say were, they, they were definitely invaded the Donbass as well. And that, and that Nemtsov was one of the biggest uh, open and loudest uh, critics of interference in Ukraine. And that is likely, I assume, why he was killed. Yeah, that's one of the reasons, absolutely. I should emphasize that Boris himself was initiator of those two marches of dissenters uh, in support, uh, support of Ukraine and um, uh, condemning Putin's um, uh, annexation of Crimea and war in, in Donbass. And my party, uh, and Nemtsov was personally was initiated on that. And my party initiated this. And at that time, that was we openly, we had an opportunity just the, the, the fight, I would say, just with the streets fight in terms of um, you know, criticizing the regime, condemning the regime. Right now, that's not possible. What would you say about the sentencing of Navalny? First of all, the... The charges are considered to be a farce by outsiders. And, but then Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman, uh, was on CNN, you know, saying that, no, 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 this is just a fraud case. There is nothing political about it. That's absolutely fabricated situation. Of course, everyone, no one in Russia, just people just who can... Can, can have just uh, independent view. <laughs> Everyone understands what it is. Of course, that's political uh, political uh, case, and that is, uh, uh, I would say, punishment of, of Navalny for his uh, investigation, cor corruption investigations, and for his political activities. He de definitely, he's a leader of the street protests. Um, uh, there was there was two, in fact, leaders of the street protests in Russia, noticeable, Boris Nemtsov and Alexei Navalny. One was killed, another one put in jail. And we have many other uh, political... And, and, but, and they tried but, to kill him as well. They tried to kill most of them. People in the streets, they were absolutely just not replaceable uh, leaders uh, of, of the protests here. Uh, yes, and uh, he is in jail because it's because he is not. Uh, uh, Putin couldn't keep patience just uh, having him just on free. Do you think that uh, Navalny's movement uh, is finished? Or do you think in some ways that it, it will continue with even more momentum because they've pledged to go international now? A lot of the people that were part of that organization have left Russia, but they're continuing to operate from outside. And even this week, yeah. uh, they put out this investigation of a yacht in Italy that is completely staffed by the Kremlin Secret Service. And it looks like that is Putin's yacht. So they are not stopping. Yeah, 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 they continue. The majority, or I would say almost all activists of uh, Navalny's movement outside, and they continue to work. That is uh, clear. And they, they, they continue making those investigations. And that, that, that route, which uh, Navalny uh, paved the way just for uh, describing corruption and just to, 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 to uh, let people understand what's going on, who are those people in power are, of course, it's uh, uh, quite interesting for people and they, they're watching this and supporting this. That's clearly, I think they will continue, I wouldn't say survive, they continue just uh, live and walk on this direction, yeah. What would you say about President Putin's mental state? I mean, you see him at these long tables, far uh, away from everybody. I, I, uh, he's isolated. He, he's been largely isolated during the pandemic in the last two years. Is, is, is he all right? 
it's difficult it's difficult to say from the medical point of view just i'm not a doctor and i haven't seen just any special conclusions but i've heard i guess if i don't uh, if i'm not mistaken and remember that uh, minister of german minister of health who is doctor has professional doctor he said something just that Putin's is out of mind. But uh, watching his reckless policy, just the complete uh, unresponsible behavior, of course, we can say politically he's out of mind. I don't know medically because I cannot make that judgment, but what he is doing is absolutely unacceptable. That's a criminal activity. And I think just the whole world already understood that what could never come back business as usual with Putin as it happened after invasion into Georgia. Do you see any strategy in what he's doing in Ukraine you know, fighting what they say is a, is a hege- hegemony. A, they want a multipolar world. No, uh, they are trying I, to stop NATO. Is there any logic in this? No, no, no. I, I think just the main the main purpose that's sensitive. It's uh, you should look from the not from the angle of uh, uh, the world uh, world dictator. We should see this from from, from the angle of um, uh, uh, Kremlin dictator and KGB dictator, and uh, the main goal is just to to press the world, Ukraine first of all, to recognize annexation of Crimea. That is the the issue. He's Putin is crazy about Crimea, and he couldn't be, I would say, um, uh, totally totally just get out of Crimea. For him, it's crucial. That's why I'm talking about uh, about just these negotiations. And I'm saying I don't believe that any positive fruit could be achieved because Ukraine will not agree on losing its territory, and Putin will not agree just until uh, uh, Ukraine recognizes um, uh, Crimea as a part as a part of Russia. What he's doing right now, I, I think he is trying to uh, set up some kind some kind of um, uh, which was. Uh, few centuries ago was called Malarossia. It means just the whole this corridor from uh, from uh, uh, Donetsk to uh, from Rostov, Russian Rostov to, to Odessa. It means just uh, uh, to occupy all this territory and to, to, to cut Ukraine uh, out of access to Azov Sea and cut Ukraine from access to Black Sea. And that's what and connect Crimea, etc. And I think that will be another another position for future negotiations. Uh, if the West or Ukraine would agree to have any negotiations with it, because as I say, we had already the example invasion in Georgia. We knew what those negotiations led to. Putin didn't implement any single point, and it just uh, in fact annexed uh, um, uh, from. Uh, or cut from from Georgia, uh, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia, and uh, that's what that what again he is going to do this way. And I, I think just uh, it seems to me it seems to me that uh, the Western leaders started to exactly realize what what is going on around. And in fact, in fact, especially Germany, who was a very close ties, economic ties with Russia, now they finally ca- come to the solution to stop purchase, purchasing oil and gradually to stop purchasing gas. It is very difficult for, for the big economy of Germany to stop purchasing gas when 40% of consumption is uh, natural gas from Russia. Do you fear a worse confrontation with Russia? Um, as right now, NATO is talking about stationing permanent forces forward in Eastern Europe, the re-militarization of borders uh, with Russia or anywhere near it, Um, talk of no-fly zone, more and more help going to Ukraine because there's a belief that Ukraine can probably defeat the Russian army right now in Ukraine uh, at a high cost, but uh, victory for the Russian army seems to be slipping away do you fear this is going to escalate and and uh, and could could even bring in nuclear weapons? Uh, I don't think nuclear weapons, but I, there's definitely the case that uh, the, the 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 whole operation, the war, slowed down, and of, of course Putin couldn't achieve what he wanted within two weeks. That the, all these uh, operations fall down. Failed, and uh, in fact, uh, in fact, of course, if no fly zone, no fly zone uh, installed, I think just uh, it will be much easier to finish the war. And these uh, negotiations will be not about just some kind of compromise, but negotiations will be how to protect uh, protect Putin's troops to get home. 
safely. That's the only negotiations, just subject of negotiations could be. And I, I think I think we clock, we we were moving in this direction, but we should, as I begin in the beginning said, we should stop uh, killing, uh, not allow to kill, to kill civilians and and destroy um, uh, infra civilian infrastructure. That's why just the the no fly zone. That's crucial thing for now and then of course will be will be clear that you're right just uh, the the ukrainians uh, uh, most most probably uh, most likely will 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 defeat uh, putin's army but it could last long that's why they need they need special special attempt just i'm not right now not in a position to to to, to have a, to discuss the military military just advantages on one or another side but uh, what, what is absolutely clear to stop bombing civilians that is the crucial point last question to you and and i know you're an economist um and and your forte is not military analysis but it, it's certainly all about the economy of russia when you look at what's happening with the sanctions, how will change if change is to come in the Kremlin after 22 years of this man who refuses to step down uh, and have any, you know, a, a passing of power to another generation? How will change come and who will it come from in Russia? I assume it's in Russia, not from the outside. Uh, that is uh, difficult to, to to talk about future because right now, of course, now of course, it's clear that the whole country should pay for this Putin invasion, for this Putin. Uh, 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 I wouldn't say mistakes, but deliberate. I would say criminal activity, and we all have to pay by just all uh, all just economic uh, uh, pr problems. And I think just uh, Russian people already started to realize that. But very soon they will uh, will, will feel it in a, in a more sensitive manner. But uh, of course, uh, of course, to to uh, start everything with the beginning, we would need to start everything with the beginning because sanctions right now just destroying all all industrial chains, and all 400 of foreign companies just stop their operation in Russia, and many simple things which is difficult even to imagine. Even even uh, you cannot uh, you cannot get your check in the, in the supermarket printed because this this is um, the paper which is used there in the, this machine, cashier um, machine, just uh, produced somewhere outside. And uh, right now there is no, there is no just this operation stopped. There are some other examples, many many other things. Even even to print rubles, uh, we need uh, uh, paper from Switzerland, a special paper for, for 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 printing money. There's all these problems. A lot of all the mark, uh, car makers already stopped operation in Russia. Just that's what the, the people already understand. Uh, but in, as I said, in a few months they would completely understand that they are under the, the iron curtain. Yeah. Uh, that, that is the issue. That's why it will be difficult uh, to start with the beginning. Uh, even beginning, not as um, uh, uh, my government, my, my cabinet started after default and crisis uh, 1998. That will be even, even, even harder this time. Even harder because at that time we were friends with the West and we got this support from the West. Right now, Russia is enemy of the West. And just that it will take lots of time so that our Western friends would finally recognize that there is no Putin anymore, I believe. But um, the other people, just normal, normal Europeans and will share those values. That's what that's that is the issue. That is the problem for generation. Mikhail Kasyanov, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much, sir. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And that's our backstory on the dire situation in Ukraine and Russia's unjust war. As we speak, a dozen or more Russian commanders have been killed in Ukraine. The battle plan is a mess. But the damage being done to Ukrainian cities is huge because Russian forces have indiscriminately shelled centers they couldn't seize. NATO has now reacted by not only sending more arms to Ukraine, but announcing more NATO battle groups will be on Europe's eastern flank, on higher readiness, more troops, more jets, and missile defense, at sea carrier strike groups and submarines on a persistent and permanent basis. Russia's attack on Ukraine isn't pushing NATO back, it's bringing it closer because of fears that Putin could try to attack NATO allies. 
Doing more will cost more. NATO allies will increase spending. Putin has failed to split Europe and North America. What he needs to do is seek peace in Ukraine and de-escalate. But knowing Putin, he won't. And that raises fears of chemical and nuclear attacks. And how does this end? I can't begin to tell you. No one can. But Russians will pay an economic price because of a war the Kremlin started. No one attacked Russia. Thanks for listening to Backstory. Please share this podcast. I'm Dana Lewis, and I'll talk to you again soon.